about a more or less momentary economic phenomenon. Well, it is. It may be momentary. That's the time we want to tell you. A lot of things I've said have been things just the time hasn't broken yet, you know. But it may be momentary, but it is, it is a, a monetary phenomenon. You must it's remember, too, economy. that it's one of the oldest cities in North America. Sure, it used to be heavy blues place one time. Because it was founded a uh, great god centuries ago by the... Uh, Trappers. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's, a, it's not the oldest city in Michigan. I'm, Mackinac but um, the that's right and you know I like uh, 8 Mile Road which uh, out in Livonia it's still and some of the signs say baseline sure. other places and, and so because of course it was one of the major uh, uh, survey lines right. struck off which much of the rest of the state was laid out watch the book but it seems to me that uh, and I know uh, a couple of elderly gentlemen in Ypsilanti, both of whom are bachelors, who uh, lived in Detroit. His uh, uh, E.O.'s first car was an electric car, and he was in the same class in school as Ansel Ford at uh, what? Oh, it's one of the college yeah. prep institute. No, college prep institution that U of D ran. Yeah, U of D High School. I don't know, but but they were both there for a while. It was apparently the thing to do. And they talk about Detroit with great affection. And, uh, you know, uh, East Grand Boulevard and all of that was, you know, like a very big deal. Uh, I understand what happens to cities when they grow older and bigger and tireder and a lot of other things. Um, but I think we're beyond now, at least in terms of urbanity, uh, that the same sense of centralization. Uh, that we once had. I rather like Highland Park being difficult and Hamtramck. I think that maybe they, uh, you know, of course they may have private um, monetary reasons sometimes for being so. The city finances in Hamtramck seem to be a zoo, but uh, I think that's all right. I must admit I find something a little bit awkward about the idea of being able to go into any street or road or anything else in the United States and feel that I'm not at home, as it were. But uh, I can even accept that within limits. And uh, I, I remember once, many years ago, it was one of my big uh, baptisms in Detroit. I went off to something. I don't know where the ballet group came from, but they were some kind of a folk ballet group from one of the Balkans. And that's like their croats and Serbs and all the rest, all right? Well, the applause at the Masonic Hall was positively stereophonic because as each national group recognized something from its area, they were all sitting together and they all and they all lived together. I know a guy whose name is Danny Bogoslavsky. And he lived, he's a Macedonian. Even, uh, even the name doesn't seem to get me. And they live on the street that they're all Macedonians on. I mean, you know, it's a very uh, interesting thing to me. I don't have anything for it or against it. It's just interesting. How do, how do these things happen? I don't know. Don't like people who gravitate to areas. People like themselves. People who have the same ideals. I don't know that it's as true of rural areas. I think the evaluations there are more functional. At least as so far as there's still farming communities, it's maybe more a matter of the nature of the process again. I think that distinction is, is a pretty important. Uh, I don't know how to account for it in terms of cities. Um, there's clearly a university ghetto in Ann Arbor. And that's what Ann Arbor is, and the rest, then the other side of Main Street and the old west side likes to pretend that Ann Arbor doesn't exist. The ra the, you know. But they also know where all the dollars are from. So it's a uh, it's a conflicting thing. I've never 
been able quite to penetrate um, all of, by any means, or even quite get the sense of the way all of the neighborhoods go on Manhattan, for example. But I think it's surely true that there are many people whose lives are lived within a 20, 30 block radius, and man, that's it. And, uh... Some of those people have the most character, too. Yes, I think so. I think so. Uh, at the same time, I think there, there is a difference in being provincial and being parochial. It seems to me that a province is like Gertie Norman's been writing off and on a lot about. It's an area in which uh, the province is the place, and it's a story. What the people, uh, who the people are, are the characters. What they do is the plot. What maybe, in fact, is happening is we're learning to apply some sense of form or aesthetics borrowed from whatever other areas have for the first time and rigorously applying them to where we live or want to live. Surely, one of the characteristics of the great pieces of American literature, by and large, is I, you know, nothing could be more rooted or local than Walden. Now, the English and the French and the German, in their wonderful way, are still firmly convinced that Thoreau was a nature writer and that Moby Dick, I suppose, is about catching a whale. Um, but I'm afraid that that's not true, that only, as Dr. Williams said, and the man who seems to me to have known more about it than anybody that r has ever written in this century, surely, um, is that only in the local is there any universal. And that's what it seems to me Patterson and a good bit else that he wrote is all about. But uh, you don't always, you're not always conscious of the universal when you're about the letters that you were saying earlier. Um, My father I isn't. Appreciate your father that's right. More. And yesterday I met, uh, yesterday I was with this friend of mine who's like working in a farm who's really a city person and he's been really into all these esoteric sciences and so on. And now he's just given them all up and now he's just doing a farm. And I was watching him talk to this friend he met who's only a farm boy, you know, totally a farm boy. And the kid doesn't know anything about the city. And he and he did the and and I was appreciating this guy who was a farm boy in a way that he could never appreciate himself. And so was my friend, you know, and I could see that uh, he, he had a great love for this guy who was just a farm boy. But the farm boy could was constantly looking at us from our questions and saying, you know, God, you guys are really dumb or something, you know. Well like he's you, right. You appreciate these things that I don't even Right. Going to the garbage dump, you know, was really an exciting thing to me. Whereas yeah. he thought we were fools, you know. Yeah. And, but he, within his context, after all, he's right. But as I said, for over a hundred years, by the way, the word "old fashioned" as a hyphenated word and a pejorative seems to have come into use in the United States at a very interesting moment, right after the Civil War. A Civil War really made, or started, or at least accentuated and intensified to a point of no return in the industrialization and urbanization of the United States, if not of North America, but n probably of North America also. And the, it became a term of uh, derogation at that time. Well, uh, a term of reproach, a term of uh, abuse. And it would seem to me, incidentally, you know, it's a very interesting thing. The local is by nature conservative in many respects in this resistance to outside influences, I think a true local is probably also a radical. Nothing in some respects is more radical than agriculture. And at least several of the more interesting um, political movements in the United States have stemmed from uh, agrarian unrest. I, I enjoy a great deal uh, the the uh, the professional mid-range uh, store owning type uh, disapproval of uh, riots and marches and things like that. I enjoy it a great deal because they seem to forget uh, 1936 and 
you know, Walter Ruther got a bloody nose and it was a goddamn, like, uh, descent of God at, or something. It's a great rallying cry. But I would like to point out that the total effect of the labor unions now and the total effect of GM strike me as being absolutely inseparable. Just as the University of Michigan belongs to the Pentagon. Right. There's no distinction. So that the last time there was a strike, in order to keep the strike going, GM, bar or GM loaned money to the UAW. They become, in fact, counter-capitalist organizations. But you see, they aren't opposites. Well, They're identicalities, I would argue. And I don't really see that there's any way that... Uh, that and, it, and there is no way, either, that either of them is going to be uh, radical. It's not, uh, it's not to uh, Woodcock's advantage to be uh, particularly... No. Well, wounded knee is really, I think, a bit different. You see, it only costs ten thousand dollars life insurance to kill off a federal marshal. I think they got a bargain going for them. So why should we miss a few? Cost more than that to do it in uh, Vietnam. It's their land. They want to shoot up a few white men. Why not? I think they're perfectly justified. You see, it's not only their land, but they've never... The Indian Claims Court, which is a very uh, interesting organization the federal government has, so it doesn't have to do anything else. A horse, or excuse me, a camel is a horse formed by a committee, um, has admitted the justice and the rightness of the in, of the Sioux, Aglala Sioux's claims to the Black Hills. The treaties were not legal, and they were never compensated. Have you got enough to buy them back? They don't know how to solve the problem. Sixteen cents an acre. Yeah. I think it was forty-eight cents an acre by the time they worked up to what was eighteen eighty-one. I think it's a treaty. And uh, what are they going to do? Even if they only paid them simple interest, uh, annual compounding, uh, it would take. Uh, well, it would probably cost as much as it did to uh, to send Nixon to China. And he bought back two pandas after all. Um, that's right. They got a few buffalo. Do you know they have to petition to get a buffalo to eat? Because the state of South Dakota has a thing called Custer State Park. It's in the Black Hills, which is theirs anyway. Jesus Christ, it's, it's wild. So they got a large herd. I think they're 1,700. The oldest animal they had was pretty old. But the largest one they ever had, it's fantastic, weighed 3,100 pounds. They're spectacular beasts. They all stand around all the time looking like they're waiting for a camera to come. They're just beautiful. I happen to be uh, kind of enthusiastic about animals. And the bison are just incredibly beautiful. So uh, they've got 1,700. When the bulls get to be 10 years old, if you've read a lot of Indian uh, firsthand and other kinds of accounts, you know that there was always an organization among the older warriors and the older men, and they were frequently among the Plains Indians called the Bulls, or sometimes the Old Bulls. Because after you got to be about 40, you didn't want to go on the war path anymore. You'd had heard everything the squaw that you were married to could possibly say. So during the daytime, you even went off and sat and meditated by yourself, or, or you talked to a few of your cronies and told lies about what you'd done, just like you know anybody else does. Well, that's what buffalo, in fact, do. After they get to be about 10, they just don't want to get in the spring hassle, or this actually breeding season's in August. They just don't want the hassle anymore. So they tend to isolate themselves. And you, 
go over a rise in Custer and you'll find five or six bulls switching the flies and off by themselves and kind of just moseying around and eating once in a while. In August it's kind of fun because it is breeding season, but by that time the sun's been pretty hot. You can hear them pulling out the grass. You get this scraping sound, even from a considerable distance as they're browsing. And uh, so the state of South Dakota says, okay, when the bulls get to be 10 years old, we'll issue you, you uh, a number of permits, all right? I think you have to pay $50. And then you get it to go out with the people from uh, the park, and they find you a 10-year-old bull. They're all branded with a year on their fanny. They find you an old one, and you get to shoot one. Well, now, do you know what this is tantamount to? Do you ever try eating a 10-year-old cow? or a 10-year-old bull. They don't even make bologna out of them. When you listen to market reports, they talk about canners and cutters. That's what they're talking about. So, and besides, $50 is a lot of money on a reservation where the average income is about $1,100. The government sends $10 million a year, they say. There's $10 million a year in one form or another, leases and everything else going into the Sioux Reservation. We, nobody can figure out what happens to it because there's only about 30,000 Sioux and it, it just couldn't be split that way that they would have so little income. Nader pointed out a long time ago, the amount that is involved, we should pay it direct. They pay out 7,000 a year nationally per Indian family and the average family income is around 1,100, 1,200. Where does the rest go? The BIA, you know what the BIA is? Bureau of Indian Affairs. You know what they tell the Indians that work for the BIA? Apples, because they're red on the outside and white underneath. No, but I, I, for the life of me, the mathematics is, is just, <coughs> it's, it's not only irrational, it, it, it's like the, uh, incredible. Their problems are, are very easy. They need somebody like, uh, they need to lose a war. So they can get the, the the government aid. The point is, of course, they weren't even citizens until 1924. The red, it's redneck country, and a majority of Indians are, in fact, rednecks. And let there be no mistake. There was a costume, a girl in a costume, and this is a perfectly respectable Indian precedent. There was a girl in a costume at Crow Fair last summer a uh, part of which costume either was or resembled the flag and they kicked her off the grounds. We don't do that around here. They give ceremonial dances at all the major powwows for all returned servicemen who are present. They're very much rednecks. They're very conservative in that dimension. Where they're radical is in other matters and then not by any means uniformly. And the more conservative the tribe, the more the more or the less disturbed they were from their original site. The crows happen to be almost unique among northern plains in that they are yet in their homelands. There were crow scouts with Custer, they made the, the one that made the celebrated remark. Um, he was putting up his, he's letting down his hair to get ready to go into battle and singing his death song. Custer wanted to know why. He says, well, because we're going, we're going home tonight, but by a route neither of us know. Um, but the more, the, the more rooted tend to be that way. That's the conflict. There are a way in which is superficially and to outsiders in a lot of other ways, whether it's Ione County, Michigan, or Crow Reservation, externally in that sense, they observe the forms and they are conservative. It's only actually engaged in processes that I could possibly argue that they become radical or even liberal. But uh, all last summer, uh, or all the time in, in other summers, it just seems to me that there's no question that the, from uh, the Canadian border straight through to Texas is the last bastion of uh, 19th century America. And they are truly, in many respects, conservative. They, uh, I, I don't, I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying I'm surely it's true. That's Nixon country, make no mistake. And there are a lot of, uh, remember, Dick Wilson, the Aglala Sioux uh, tribal leader, is precisely the one, the kind that Gary Snyder was talking about, crew cut and pickups. 
and they're all the same age as Bob Nat McNamara and Norman Mailer and the rest of the group that are very dominant in almost any kind of institution or life right now. They're all out of World War II. An awful lot of the most frustrating aspects to me, being mid-range, as it were, about the whole youth movement is precisely the fact it seems to be doomed because they, not because they're wrong or because what they're doing is bad, but because they just got to wait for the vets to die off the World War II. They run the universities. Here, a former labor lawyer, a negotiator heading a university, and a junior officer in World War II. McNamara. Mailer. He's never gotten over the three-day drunk, the perpetual drunk of uh, the naked and the dead. And he's still, by God, going to get in a fist fight and beat the hell out of him. He's still a top sergeant, a rip torn. <laughs> Serial monogamy. And you've got hundreds of them all over them. That's where your major professorships are. That's where our fathers are. Exactly. What do you see as changes coming? I'm curious. You were talking before you guys arrived, Russell was saying, or some of you anyway, trying to feel out what people like ourselves could be doing or should be doing with our lives. And you're suggesting you were suggesting that moving out to a rural area was not a was not a was not tantamount to desertion of something. Of course it's not. But it's a horrendous discipline. It's worse than becoming a capuchin or a Trappist, I'll tell you that. They had it easy. Well, what do you think is happening with their society? Has anyone read Seven Story Mountain, by the way? It's very useful. If you can imagine the discipline that that nice, bright Columbia Phi Beta Kappa, uh, bilingual, raised France, sophisticated <coughs> art family and all that, Merton went through, and then went to be a Trappist at Gethsemane in Kentucky, where you do everything in a certain way at a certain time, and it's hot, and the barn burns, and the cows are out there. All they start to make cheese, and God knows all. It's a good introduction, because after all, his background in that sense—you know, universities and all that literary promise him had to uh, had to undergo fantastic changes before he could begin to make sense of it. The discipline the particular expression I'm not advocating. The nature of the discipline seems to me imperative. If you go, just be prepared for a lot of failures and nobody standing around and applauding or sympathizing. If you go, don't expect the whole goddamn community to, uh, to embrace you immediately. If you go, do the smart thing. I don't care where it is, here or Kamchata, get acquainted with the kids. They're always your avenue. Children are the best things that ever happened to human beings. And if the kids like you, I know a guy that learned German very early because he was in the army, very rapidly, he was in the army. And they had this big ammo and other kind of dump place. And the German kids played there. So he'd sit around and he made all kinds of mistakes. And they laughed at the way he talked German. But they kept on teaching him. He not only met the kids and learned the language, he got to know their parents. Well, in a way, the kind of discipline you're going through is another kind of rearing. It's self-rearing, but you're going to start out until you borrow an image as a little child all over again. You might as well get acquainted with a few of the others. One of my best friends is my 13-year-old nephew. It's... Uh, I think it's, well, I also happen to be a bachelor, maybe that's the reason, but uh, I think that that's, that's one of the most productive of all ways. First of all, they don't make all the kinds of insidious distinctions that adults make. They're blunter. They sometimes put you off uh, immediately in the bluntness of their questions, but uh, they're not malicious. They haven't learned that yet. So I think, I think that's one way of doing it. You can always... By and large, you only have to have 60 hours in Michigan. You can substitute teach. Now, some places you're going to get, I don't know what they pay in Detroit for substitute teaching, but 60 hours will let you teach a lot, a lot of places. And I know that in some, they're still paying like 15 or $20 a day. On the other hand, you didn't have to spend, you didn't have to spend $20, uh, $20 to get to work either. 
So you can always substitute teeth. That's one possibility. The local padres of whatever denomination are sometimes a little stuffy, but even they can normally uh, give you a, an angler tool. And if you're prepared to work your fannies off, Summertime help is hard for farmers to find. Well, they're not going to turn you loose on a $25,000 self-propelled combine the first time out. So you're going to end up stacking bales. And the only way uh, 45 pounds uh, in, at, at 8 o'clock in the morning, but by 6 o'clock at night, they weigh 450 pounds. They just seem to get it. But part-time labor, but it's very hard work. It doesn't last all year, but while it goes on, it, it, I've got several friends here in Ann Arbor. My father is, is right up front about it all. Oh, he says, bring them anytime you want to. He says, bring them anytime you want to, but make sure they're here for hay baling. Because he likes the help then. So some of them actually enjoy going up there. My mother stays, uh, stays uh, right in the kitchen and will bake up a storm. And uh, you go up and they put away a couple of fields in one day. But it's a son of a bitch. Then they go off to the quarry and go swimming. They've had a good, you know, fine. My brothers are up there. So, the, a lot of ball is played. A lot of softball. A lot of basketball. And it, if it were, and there's still, you know, I've got brothers-in-law that'll never get out of high school. They just don't want it. You know, they're still doing all those things. But it's another way. Certain kinds of real mechanical skills, if you can really fix certain kinds of things and know how to do it with some dispatch, you know, nobody wants, the goddamn combines are broken, they need it welded, they don't want you to get to be an artist, they want you to get the goddamn thing done. But there are all those kinds of skills are highly marketable. I mean, you may not make a living from any one of them. But uh, there's, there are lots of things like that. A veterinarian has a, an easy shake of it. No question. What, are you, what changes do you see in this country in the next couple of years? Like, next I, couple of years? Well, this year, for instance, for this summer. Like, all my sources say there's going to be a lot of change and a lot of stronger changes throughout the mass of people. And I'm curious, I'm just curious which way everything's going to fall. Yeah, what's going to happen like the Civil War to like, uh, set, to like, it's already there's already separation. What's and there's something new forming. But what's going to happen? It just pushes right into that and uh, finally make that uh, uh, separation. It can't be some child's blunt words, but it would be something much sharper. And I I, I think one of the things that uh, um, bothers me here is that. Um, I think probably that if there are changes, it'll be that there are just more people going someplace. And I think that's good. I don't care, you know, pick up your knapsack revolution and go. I think that's all right. I think that's a pretty important thing. I think that probably we've seen a diminution of European influences and people running off to Europe. I don't anticipate that except on the reservations it's going to be a hot summer at all. I, I can't see it. I think on some of the reservations it's going to be touch and go. They truly have causes. Their causes are very different than the urban unrest of Detroit in 67. Because they're not talking just about economics, really. Or oppression in the essentially political and economic inseparable way. There really is more, much more a lifestyle question involved. And I don't think this was really as true as people tried to make it in Detroit in 67. I think there, essentially, anybody that could make enough money, they were happy. Now, you don't have to, it doesn't matter what, uh, apparently what color you are, everybody wants to move to the suburbs. Uh, but I think a lot of it was jobs and gouging and loan sharks and essentially, it seems to me, uh, sooner or later, an economic thing. I think the reservations are different. I think the last thing that very many whites, even with the best will in the world, can do is help them. I don't think we can. I kind of like to sit around and watch. I like to be there. Two or three that I know, it's different. But my own quotes, Indian education, unquotes, uh, consists of knowing a couple of uh, boys that my nephew met 
that we met there for at Crow Fair last summer in particular. And uh, they're 12 and 14. My feeling is that uh, I can't expect probably to get to know um, those who are my age or in between there and now. I better get acquainted with them as I see them coming. I don't see that many Personally, it seems to me that the changes that are likely to happen are more sorting out. You know, there are now more communes closing than opening. I don't think there's any big exodus back to the land. I don't think it works for most people. As you said, it's hard work. That's right. It's, an, it's incessant. It has its own way of being like nagging, even, if you want to be accurate about it. But I think that you'll find the same incessancy in nagging just anywhere. Yes, but you've got more company to share it with in Ann Arbor, Detroit. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's and misery and, and discomfort loves that. Misery loves comfort. That's right. And, it, uh, you know, the worst thing about truisms is that they are. And uh, I, I, I think even, I, I'll be honest, I think even the age of the, uh, of the, uh, summer jazz festival as a form of belonging has passed. Oh, sure. See, here you're, this is where you're, however, how old are you now? Russell? 42. This is where you're 42 and we're yeah. younger in the sense that... That's over. Right. The Beatles are over. There'll never be that kind of movement again. Well, we know that. All right. <laughs> but there's nothing that's going to take their place. Their ice. Not, not like that. That yeah. was a big bubble. But don't you see that they, they even then, they were about as short-lived as, uh, as uh, what's the kind of fly that's born and, and everything on it, does everything and dies all in about 24, 40, what? Fly. Yeah, very, very, Drosophila, <laughs> Drosophila. Um, they really were that. You know, think what I, think, I think about it another way to turn the, to turn the remark around. I think about, gee, Dylan's old and I'm not. All right. I heard of Bob Dylan. Yeah, no. I don't. Know. Become a movie star. Got a book coming out very shortly. The complete works, sixty-two to seventy-two. What are they? Like Alistair Crowley publishing his complete works at the age of twenty-eight. <laughs> he did. Did he really? Yes. I think that they're also. I think that one of the other things that's a bad, at you know, one level bad, and another level, of course, you have to let. You can't say that. I mean, it's a. That is that the job market's never been so good for college graduates as it is this summer, not four or five years. Well, that's going to take off a lot of energy I, in some ways, wish weren't take, being taken off. Um, I think more people are writing notebooks, keeping journals, and I kind of think that maybe in the long run, you know the root of the, la of the word salvation, is the Latin word for health. And I I kind of have a feeling that even if we get together and talk a lot about a lot of things, that maybe a lot of the solutions have got to come with the application of, of self to task. In many instances, that means that I'm worrying about, you know, sitting at my desk doing something, uh, revising or something, but it's still a process. I think that probably the best thing that's happened since 1960 in a lot of ways is the growth of the craft industries. You know, potters make pots now essentially the way they made yeah, them. That's getting out of control. I still like the idea of the process. I've got no, great I mean, the, faith. Do you realize that the, that the numbers of potters at the fairs have increased almost exponentially from mm -hmm. in their incredible quantities? I, mean, yeah. I know that. It's harder to make a living that way. Oh, of course it is. Maybe they'll do I mean, it. Be, maybe they'll do it for its own sake. Right. I think the process thing. That you're saying. Yeah, I think it's right. And music too. You know, everybody plays guitar. Everybody knows how to But you still have to find something that you want <coughs> to do. You know, that you personally want to do. You know, as a process. Yeah. yeah. I understand you. And I, you're right. And. I don't know. It seems to me that that probably also it's like I'm the the business. You know, I've been writing down all uh, since 
about the first of the month, March rather. A little record of all the seasonal changes, you know, because that's the big process. You know what I know something so That's the big, that's that's the big funny. yeah. Is that's the curious big, about yeah. the, last, the last three days of February for me. I didn't start until about, I started on my birthday. Um, and that's, that, you know, nature, that's the big process. Right, but in order to enjoy that big process. You gotta be very patient. Aside from patience, you have to do something to stay alive, just to be able to appreciate those seasons or whatever. I mean, you or had to have your father, father like, uh, to do his thing, you know, so that you could appreciate him, you know? And partly he, true. He, he allowed you to, you have to have your work or something to keep you alive. You're in a strange situation, since you were raised on a farm. Mm -hmm. I was raised in around farms and studied nature, like, very, so I was very close to, to, uh, Thanks, dear. Mm -hmm. So that that gives us an idea, and I don't know who else here has had the same kind of upbringing of, at least you know, I speak for myself that way, of slow processes to some degree, even if even if it's not conscious. You know, I think that that's a lot of what's what's in you, and I think that's a lot of what yeah. makes me me. Yeah. Is that I spent all those years studying them, and collecting them, and had boxes of butterflies stacked that high. Then your reptile summer. And I have thousands, the, the largest skeletal collection donated to the University of Michigan mm. ever. And I'm sure they were horrified, as you would say, you know, that they had to catalog every one of those things. Anyway, so so I, I'm just starting to surface on that. I mean, I was not aware of any of the, of hardly anything I learned all those years. Well, other than just the all right. specific. I don't think we are really are conscious of learning things in a certain way. Oh, if you go out and learn the multiplication tables or the aorist verb right. or something, that's a little bit, that doesn't really count. You know, that's okay. not what I mean. But it would seem to me if this is really true about music in Detroit right now, well then somebody ought to be writing it all down. Well, this is something Bob likes to believe. Bob's right in one sense. Then again, I think that you're, you have a vested interest. Well, time will tell, you know. True. I, besides, besides my vested interest, it wasn't my best interest to come to I realized the potential of living in Detroit as an artist. To me, Detroit is a is like a, an, a like when you run out of other stuff, you dig deeper, and it's got some it's got a, a history or a past to it mm -hmm. that involves a lot of suffering, and that's the essentially what Detroit has to offer is its suffering. Yeah, but you suffer so long, then you get released, you know. And I'm on the release side. Of well, our, isn't our whole culture digging down, looking for the roots and everything, yeah. trying to get direction from? Right. We take everything up. You know, blues yeah. got thrown. Everything is getting thrown into it. Well, the tree is the top is just like the roots, right? But we're looking down into it. We're not up and we're not flowering. You know, we're looking for direction. Uh -huh. And Detroit has got is one of the roughest cities there are right. in this country. Right. Supposedly, we've been told that anyway. But right. what's the murder city? Hey. How old are you, Bob? 25. Well, I'll tell you one thing you could do this summer. It might be an interesting process. Get to know any three or four random people who are 40. Not old enough to be parents. Old enough to have had more experiences, a wide range of them than you've had. You mean like anywhere older Young enough to be or a, or around 40-ish. Okay, yeah. In other words, accessible, but not parental and not contemporaries. One of the worst curses of growing up in the United States is that you're, you're locked into the goddamn contemporary scene most of the time. Pure group. So it, it, it's too descriptive. It's awful. Right, that's the same thing. It's awful. Or get to, I'll tell you what, better than that, get to know somebody 40 and somebody 70. I know somebody 70 and uh, okay. 80, I know a lot of people like that. You know, that I've learned a lot from This is the same information that's coming up, I guess, all over. Yeah, it's terrible. Well, what do you say? No, what I want to do is live with older people. Well, you know, I can understand that. Well, what do you want to do? Well, you have lived with older people. Yeah, I have a lot. You don't my, like that or something? Yeah, I like it. And my and my grandpa was a very big influence. But that's not right now where I am. He always wanted me to go across the street and buy him five more white owls when I was deep in a chapter that I wanted to finish. It was pretty funny at times. White Owls are our weekday cigars, oh. not Sunday cigars. 
guys for what? Oh, if I went and got him a Sunday cigar, I usually buy him a bearing. But uh, he got like he thought a Dutch Master would be all right for Sunday. You know? it, it, <laughs> the whole thing's incredible. Uh, what, are, what are you going to do with yourself? Oh, I'm going. Uh, obviously, I'm going to finish up uh, the best year of the summer. Uh, I'm writing a book, uh, a text for a group of uh, drawings. Twenty, let's see, twenty-six of them by. Probably the most spectacular uh, drawer of animals I've ever met or seen. They're just—I'll never be able to come up to the uh, the uh, quality of the drawings in the text because I'm just not as good as she is. It's a wife, very good friend of mine, and they're just absolutely spectacular. She gave me the bison as a Christmas gift, and we're going to use that. And I've got the uh, river otter, Lutra canadensis, um, kangaroo rat. Eastern Cottontail, and uh, three or four other of them at home now. Uh, so I'm going to be working on that. Because we wonder, what the heck are you doing that for? Why am I doing that? Right. Because it seems to me that next to children, animals are the most destructive things to learn about. They're never out of character. They're not like we are. They didn't have to wait or learn their vocations. They're born in. They are instructive. Oh, instructive. Yes, right. because they're always in character. Uh -huh. I see. That's... They're always in character. That, that goes with the... Also, I like them a great deal. Oh, right. I, you know, it just seems you write about what you uh, love, I guess. Um, right. So I know I'm doing that, and then I hope maybe out of the this summer uh, and going out west again, and then if I go. Do some. I want to go to Patterson, uh, New Jersey, which is sort of like a smaller version of Detroit. But the reason for going there is it has its own way also of being a sacred site because it was Carlos Williams' hometown, and it's the town about which he wrote the poem. And there's a very important thing to me, and I, oh, I try to avoid either nostalgia or sentiment about it, but it's a very important thing to me to verify a text in situ, on location. I don't think it's going to improve, alter, change very much, but I think it's kind of neat reading uh, Walden um, around the state park they made of it, if you can get enough beer cans all the way to find a place to sit down. Um, better yet, go to the Maine Woods or Cape Cod, because they're, um, those, those two books of his are immensely useful on those locations. So I'm going to try to finish up the eastern pieces and lay them down against the western things. And uh, all I told you, I might take that teaching job. I don't know. Right. Um, I guess that one of the things that I've quit doing is trying to anticipate beyond the immediate point of where I am very much. Really? <laughs> all right, I have the tasks that I know and that are here. And, um, you know, all of, I'm just not... I don't have any idea what I'll be doing next winter. I don't know. It's too far away. Okay. All right? Sure. And also, you know, Americans have a tendency. I, I, when I was in the dorm, I used to be constantly amazed by all of these 18-year-old boys that would come in, and they still were. They registered for the draft and came to college, and they were certain they were all pre-med, and they all were going to be doctors. One, because their parents had told them that was a good way of avoiding the economic hassles of a depression. The generations have changed slightly since then. The other thing is, here they were, committed to something when they entered, about which they had nothing but kind of a strong feeling, but not as yet any vital experience. They go to the first two or three labs in which they have to, what's the one in uh, comparative anatomy and the, the, the fish you usually cut up? Which one is it? They go they got sick the first day, you know, they can't even cut up the, well, of course, the formaldehyde's pretty bad, and those labs do get pretty ripe after a while, but... Uh, and then they suddenly they got this huge crisis. They didn't know what they wanted to be anymore. And uh, that's not really a very useful or a loose way of living. And I can't say to anybody else, you know, uh, 
go do whatever you can do because sometimes people don't feel they can do anything. But if worse comes to worse, I'll, you know, toss hamburgers someplace. I, that kind of, that kind of bag doesn't hold me up. I don't, you know, if I had to wash dishes, I had to wash dishes. I don't care. Because this is full excitement of, of but that's inside one's head. moving out into... Uh, A lot of that's in one's uh, head, though, you know. Box next, in or out. Uh, we still have to move out into it. And, and do it? Well, we have to live. All right, then you know, fine. One of the things that it seems to me that anybody that wanted a way out for the summer could conceivably consider would be, uh, um, you know, well, it's harder, harder with it, you know, iotis, but uh, go work up north. In fact, there are places you can probably get free housing for the winter if you work for the summer. Right. You'll have snow up to your crotch all the time, but... Uh, right, well, for me, it's we're it. thinking of getting rid of a lot of the stuff we own and having less things. Mm -hmm. Maybe getting rid of, once again, of all the books I've managed to accumulate since I got rid of the ones last year. <laughs> They don't know what it was like before either, do they? No, oh, hey. no idea. How many hours did it take me just to price them? I don't know. We worked a long time, didn't we? I had a lot of <laughs> And I don't even know anymore what, what I want to do. And I feel this strong change. Like, you and I are close to each other that way, in the sense that we take things... I don't know whether we've known each other for years, Fox, Nix, that's yeah. the reason. And I feel this tremendous change coming up. I think I'm, I'm real glad about it. Huh. Gee, it's like throwing the traces over. Right. I, I think there's another thing that happens. Maybe it's happened also as I've gotten older. I don't know if it's an age thing or not. But I really don't have. Uh, I don't feel very threatened if, by the nature of whatever it is, I have to do to pay the light bill. In other words.